good evening everyone uh, i welcome on behalf of v vivekananda samiti iit kanpur i welcome you all to the third and last day of our lecture series on uh, vedanta by swami sarvapriyanand ji um, we'll move on to the lecture uh, following a felicitation of swami ji by our director uh, but a few words about vivekananda samiti before that uh, vivekananda samiti is one of the oldest clubs under the students gymkhana of iit kanpur functioning for over four decades now it has been disseminating and actualizing the teachings of swami vivekananda not only on campus but also outside it we have conducted several activities including community services such as literary camps and health camps for the underprivileged weekly discussions on swami vivekananda's life and works sanskrit and vedanta classes and talks and workshops on various subjects by eminent scholars just before the mid semester recess with the help of ramkrishna mission ashram hospital and shankara i hospital of kanpur we had organized a free medical camp at ratanpur village where we served over 110 pati 10 patients during the mid sem break we organized a seven day retreat spiritual retreat at ramakrishna kutir almora with the help of swami narasimhananda ji the editor of prabuddha bharat mayavati During the retreat we conducted meditation sessions discourses on the Bhagavad Gita and practical vedanta personal counseling work and ethics and nature walks we also conduct workshops and short term courses on sanskrit we would be starting a 6 month course uh, on sanskrit called pravesha from 21st march in, asso in association with sanskrit bharati we would be starting a guided meditation session weekly guided med meditation session starting this saturday Uh, conducted by swami satya mayanand ji who is the head of the kanpur ramakrishna mission ashram so uh, i uh, i encourage you all to be part of the samiti and we are soon going to invite nominations for secretaries uh, of vivekananda samiti for the year 2015 16 uh, for any queries you you could contact us uh, on either of these uh, okay now a brief introduction to our speaker today <clears throat> Swami Sarvapriyanand ji has been a monastic member of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission for over 20 years now since he joined the order in 1994 Swami ji holds a degree in business management from the Xavier Institute of Management Bhubaneswar He has served the Ramakrishna Math and Mission in various capacities including being the vice principal of the Deoghar Vidyapeeth Higher Secondary School principal of the Shikhan Mandir Teachers Training College at Belur Math and the first registrar of the Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University at Belur Math at present he is an acharya of the monastic probationers training center at Belur Math recently he has been ordained assistant minister in charge of the Vedanta Society of Southern California Los Angeles United States Swami ji has been a speaker at TEDx IIM Ranchi besides premier indian institutes like the IITs and IISC he has also delivered lectures on vedanta extensively across the united states australia and new zealand including noted universities such as the university of queensland university of sydney university of adelaide victoria university and university of north texas etc his interests lie in the fields of indian and western philosophy spirituality psychology management sciences and education so we would move on to uh, our last lecture um, but before that i would request uh, director sir to Uh, kindly felicitate swami ji and uh, what is uh, absolutely amazing is that first of all none of you can guess his age and he radiates truly wisdom and this is what i keep telling to my all my friends that here we in iit system or in an institution like ours we essentially deal with only one commodity that's knowledge and we try to gain knowledge through various means and uh, in a setup like ours the highest degree one of the highest degrees that we can aspire for is a phd which is a uh, doctorate of philosophy is not of mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or anything like that so while we pursue ma machines components or equations or you know new exploits at times we tend to lose sight of the ultimate of all these uh, things that we pursue 
uh, we need, we all aspire to be enriched and also enrich the surroundings. So the journey is never ending. The journey always continues and we keep learning at each and every step. And when you interact with a, a, with a person uh, of the, uh, you know, educational background and of wisdom of the order of Swami Sarvapriya Nandaji, you certainly feel enlightened. So we are all very fortunate and uh, again on behalf of the Institute, we certainly are very grateful that you came and probably this is your second visit or third visit. Yeah. So, and of course you'll be now positioned in uh, US for a while, but I think our Vivekanan Samiti will continue to have links with you. And uh, we certainly want our the entire community to to pursue the ultimate uh, sucker of knowledge, and that can happen only when we are uh, we can get ourselves rid of all the you know narrowness. And I think your discourse on Vedant probably will certainly help us to reach that. So thank you again, Swamiji. Today's lecture is titled Defining God based on Taittiriya Upanishad. Philosophers and spiritual aspirants East or West, ancient or contemporary have con constantly grappled with what appears to be a crucial and necessary issue for humankind. The age old question, what is God? In this lecture, Swamiji will take us through a unique definition of God as revealed by Taittiriya Upanishad, which is one of the 10 principal Upanishads. Thank you. Um, very good evening. Namaskars to all of you. And congratulations for braving the inclement weather to be here for a talk on Vedanta philosophy on a Sunday evening in this weather, turning up in such large numbers for a talk on philosophy and that too on Vedanta philosophy says a lot for the intellectual climate of IIT Kanpur. So you are to be congratulated for that. Um, we'll go straight into the subject. What is God? That is the subject today. It's a question many of us, we have asked ourselves at some time in our life, maybe more than once. It's a question which we have been asked by others. Whenever you talk about religion, somebody or the other will ask you, how do you define God? What do you mean by God? Whether you believe in God or you are arguing against the existence of God, both of you will be interested, both sides will be interested in the definition of God. What do you mean? When you use a term, you must have a clear meaning for that term. And God is one of those terms which is very vague. Uh, it has been used in so many senses and often we are not sure what sense we are using it in. Uh, when we talk about it or read about it, we are not even sure what sense the author is using the term God. As scientists and especially as engineers, I'm sure you would be very uncomfortable in such a situation uh, to deal, you know, to argue vehemently about terms which are ill-defined. So definition of God, the very finest definition which I have personally come across in all my studies in, in the philosophies of the East and the West is this definition. In Vedanta they say the perfect definition of God is, you know, the, there's a term maunam vyakyanam, silence is the perfect definition. But for that definition, I don't think you can have a lecture. Uh, you wouldn't turn up for <laughs> a definition which is silence. But below that, below that level, below the level of realization, actually having a direct realization of God, prior to that, not going so far, what is the best that we can do? The best that I have come across, I will present it before you. It's a definition of God found in the Upanishads you will see how, um, how much clarity there is in that thinking. You will see the breadth of vision in that thinking, which, which will be presented here today. And not only that, you know, not only will it be a definition, it will not remain theoretical. When you're talking about definition, it seems something which remains in the books. But as we go through that, you'll suddenly see, see that they are talking about a reality which we all know, but we never thought about which we all experience. Just now, you and I, we are experiencing what they're going to talk about. But we never thought about it in that way. We never pay attention to that. 
that is what uh, this definition points to. Now this definition you to understand it, it is one long sustained argument. Yesterday we had a um, lecture on the essence of Advaita Vedanta, the eternal witness from Panchadashi. That was a series of arguments, small arguments, but a series of arguments. But this is just one argument. It will take around 40 minutes to unpack, but you have to follow it all through. It is just like one of those long mathematical proofs which you are used to. Uh, so you must follow very carefully. Uh, every step of the, every link is important because it is one argument, you miss one link then uh, uh, you, you won't get what is coming. To enjoy it properly, three stages are necessary. The first stage is a basic minimum. You should be able to say what I said. What the speaker has said, if somebody asks you, you say, hey, yeah, he said this, I may not believe it, I may not even understand it but I should at least be able to repeat back what he has said. So that, that shows that I have listened carefully. The second stage is after listening carefully to what the Upanishad is saying or what I am saying, the second stage will be to try to understand it. That is the stage of intellectual comprehension. And the third stage, deeper stage will be to actually every step of the way to feel it, to see it as a living reality. If you can do that, by the time you walk out of the classroom, you will be uh, Brahmagyani. But that's very ambitious. That may might not happen. But at least a glimpse of that is possible. Because none of it, what they are going to talk about, is beyond our current perception just now. So three stages. First is absolute minimum. Otherwise, there is no use sitting here. Uh, what did he say? Patani kya that, that That won't do. So let's go ahead. Uh, into defining God. The definition I am going to talk about comes from Vedanta. As I said yesterday, Vedanta is a spiritual philosophy based on the Upanishads, the ancient texts found in the Vedas. And uh, in the Vedas, there are these wisdom teachings called the Upanishads. Among the Upanishads, one of them is Taittiriya Upanishad. In the Taittiriya Upanishad, the Taittiriya Upanishad is found in the Krishna Yajur Veda. And in the Taittiriya Upanishad, in the second chapter called the Brahmananda Valli, the very beginning you find a passage where the first sentence encapsulates the whole of Vedanta. It says, Brahma Vidapnoti Param, the knower of Brahman attains the highest. The knower of Brahman attains the highest. Brahma with Apnoti Param. Brahman is just the word we are using for God in, in Vedanta. I am using the word God in a very loose sense, uh, any conception of God. So Brahman is the term which we are trying to define. In Sanskrit, the term is Brahman. And the, the passage starts with Brahma with Apnoti Param. This very short sentence encapsulates the whole of Vedanta. What does it say? The knower of Brahman realizes the highest. The moment we are faced with this question, with, with this statement, three questions should come to our minds. One, what is this Brahman we are talking about? It is just a word. What do you mean by Brahman? Please define Brahman for me. Second, what do you mean by knowing Brahman? How does one know Brahman? What does it mean to know Brahman? Third, attains the highest. What do you mean by the highest? Any intelligent student, if the teacher promises a little kid, do this work and I will give you a prize. You say, sir or ma'am, what is the prize? Before the person does that work. So what is the highest? If I realize Brahman, if I know Brahman, I will get the highest. But what do you mean by the highest? Three questions. The first question is what concerns us today. What do you mean by God or what do you mean by Brahman? The next few lines in that Upanishad, in that uh, first paragraph, they give answers to all three questions. The first question, what is Brahman, is answered subsequently. It says, Tadeshabhyuktam, it is said in this way. What is said? What is Brahman? The answer is today's topic. Satyam Jnanam Anandam Brahma. That is the definition of Brahman. First question is, what is Brahman? That the answer given is, Brahman is Satyam Jnanam and Anantam. 
Brahman, what you want to know is Satyam Jnanam Anantam. That's the definition of Brahman. The answers to the other two questions I will quickly touch upon at the end of the talk, but it's your responsibility to remind me. How do you know this Brahman and what is the highest you are supposed to know? But it does not concern us today. What concerns us today is only this definition of Brahman. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. Brahman is the word and its uh, conjugation will be Brahma in Sanskrit grammar. So, this is the way it is put. Brahma. It means Brahman. How do you translate this? Normally, Satyam is translated as truth, but you will see why I have translated it as reality. Reality. Jnanam means knowledge in Sanskrit and in most Indian languages. And Anantam means infinity. Reality, knowledge, infinity is Brahman. This is Taittiriya Upanishad 2.1. This Upanishad with its translation, with a very nice translation will be available outside and the Kanpur Ashram has kindly provided the books. If anybody wants it, they can get it. I think in Hindi, English it will be available in Bengali also. And also Panchadashi which I referred to yesterday. Anyway, now we are going to go into this definition. This very compact definition to be understood needs to be unpacked. You are all computer, uh, you use, use computers, so you all know about zip files, where a lot of files are packed into one file, it is zipped up. Now, that is compact, but the problem is you cannot use it as it is. In order to use it, you have to unpack it. In order to understand this definition, we have to unpack it. And right now, we are going to start the process of unpacking. The process will be, you start from here. Brahma. What is Brahma? Anantam. Anantam is Brahma. What does it mean? Let's start. Anantam. Anta, the word antam means limit. Literally it means end. Ant. In Sanskrit, in Hindi, in many Beng uh, in, uh, Indian languages also, anta means uh, end or limit. Antam is limit. And na antam would mean no limit or limitless. Now in Vedanta, limit means there are three kinds of limits. One is space, one, another one is time, another one is vastu. What are these? I will explain. Limitation in space. What is limitation in space? What it, limitation in space means when a, any particular object that we see here, for example, has a location in space. A location in space would mean it is located in a particular space and not in other places. So this piece of chalk is in my hand, it means that it is not there. If I throw it there, it won't be in my, on my hand. You are here in this lecture hall, it means you are not in your room. You can't be there. You are located in this space, means you are not located elsewhere. You are limited to this particular space. Any object which we come across in day to day, uh, transactions in this world has location in space, has a limitation in space. This lecture hall has a limitation in space. Outside this room, it is no longer this lecture hall. Even IIT Kanpur has a limitation in space. This huge campus is a limitation. Outside the campus, no longer IIT Kanpur. Even this country has a limitation in space. You cross the international boundary, it is uh, Pakistan or Nepal or Bangladesh, it is no longer India. I remember I was giving, I was talking about this the university uh, of, I think in Texas, not the university, in one uh, Vedanta society there. And I was saying that even Texas has a limit, because they are very proud it is such a big, big state. And they, they, after some time, Texas also comes to an end. And they all burst out laughing. <laughs> so, everything is, has a limit in space, has a limit in space. So, that is called Desha Paricheda. In Sanskrit, it will be called Desha Paricheda. Paricheda means cutting. Cheda means cut. So things are cut off in space. Beyond this, that thing does not exist. On the other side, this thing does not extend. It is only in that. Now, to say that something does not have limitation in space, it says Desha Paricheda Shunyam, divide of limitation in space. Because you said that no limit, na antam. If desha is one of the anta limits, na antam would mean there is no limitation in space. 
you are defining Brahman as at this point Brahman is a concept. You are defining the concept as some entity which has no limitation in space. What would that mean? Desha Paricheda Shunyam would imply that Brahman, there is no space where Brahman is not located. Brahman is not limited to a particular space. There is no particular space where Brahman is and it is not there in other spaces. Which means, in other words, Brahman is, in Sanskrit it would be Sarvavyapi, all pervading, or in English you can say omnipresent. Brahman is omnipresent. Why? How does it come about? Desha Paricheda Shunyam. Na Antam. No limit. One of the limits is space. No limit in space. It means it is all pervading. There is no space where Brahman is not. Okay. Let us go to the next Kala. Time. Kala is time. Kala Paricheda. Limitation in time means Every object that we know of, every entity has a beginning and an end in time. The time when I was born and the time when I shall die. The time when this piece of chalk was created and the time when it shall be destroyed. Creation and destruction. In between it exists. Before that it did not exist. After that it will not exist. You know, in graveyards where people are buried after death, you will find these tombstones. The person was born in 1910 and he died in 2000. So there will be a dash here. He was born in 1910 and passed away in 2000. And one Swami joked very nicely, what is life? Life is a dash from the womb to the tomb. From the womb to the tomb. Uh, but this just expresses Kala Paricheda. This is the beginning. Before this, I was not there, presumably. After this, I will not be there, presumably. That person is, has, is gone. So it's cut off in time, beginning and end. And every entity we know, from um, uh, a little an, uh, ant crawling on the ground, to the stars and galaxies, they are beginning and end. Now suppose something does not have any limitation in time. Kala Paricheda Shunyam. Kala Paricheda cut off in time. Cut off in time. But suppose there is no limitation in time. These limits are not there. And then what does it mean actually? The thing obviously it means the thing has no beginning and the thing has no end. That entity which you are defining as unlimited in time, it means that there was no time when Brahman was not and there will be no time when Brahman will not be. So, in all three periods of time, past, present and future, Brahman exists or Brahman is. Brahman is not cut off in any period of time. Beginning and end, you cannot speak of a beginning and end of Brahman. Somebody said, well, if nothingness also has no, no beginning and end, <laughs> something does not exist. So, here it is something that exists. And for that it is being said, it has no limitation in time. A positive entity which has no limitation in time. No beginning and no end. What would that imply? Kala, no limit, no time limit would imply, as you can see, Kala Paricheda Shunyam would imply the thing is eternal. Nityam, Nityam, eternal. Sanatan also would be that. The term means eternal. So, there is no point of time in which Brahman, you can say Brahman was, did not exist. And this point of time Brahman was created. This point of time Brahman was destroyed. After this Brahman does not exist. You do not say that. No limit in time. Eternal. These two are pretty simple. Now, we come to a very interesting concept. Vastu. Vastu means object. What is a vastu? A common sense use of the word vastu. All these are vastus. This bottle of water is a vastu. Um, this duster and chalk and table, this classroom, all are vastus. Our bodies, these are also vastus. Any entity is a vastu. Any entity is a vastu. You might even extend it to abstract entities like numbers. So, vastu. 
any particular thing, any entity is a vastu. Now, Vedanta considers a vastu as a limitation. How is a vastu a limitation? It works this way. If this thing is a chalk, then there are so many things which this thing is not. This is a chalk, but it is not a duster. Because it is a chalk, you are defining it as a chalk. Because of that, it is not a table, it is not a human being, it is not a classroom, it is not a computer, it is a chalk. What is its vastu paricheda, limitation of vastu? It is limited to being a chalk. Moment you identify it as a particular vastu, are you getting this way of thinking? Uh, we see everything as an identity, A is A, that is an identity. But the moment you say A is A, it immediately implies it is not B, C, D, E, F, G, S, it is nothing else except A. The moment you say it is a chalk, it is a chalk and whatever comes under the connotation of chalk, but whatever comes under not chalk is excluded from the identity of the chalk. This is called vastu paricheda. And all of us have that, every entity has that, otherwise it would not be an entity, it would not have any identity. But suppose you say that there is something called Brahman, which is vastu paricheda shunyam, which does not, is not limited to be any particular entity. Now follow this carefully, the magic happens here. If there is such an entity, we will come to that whether it is there or not, but if there is such an entity, what would it entail? It entails that something which is not limited to a particular vastu, it means there is no vastu separate from it. This thing has a vastu paricheda, that means there are so many vastus separate from it. If there is no vastu paricheda, then there would be no vastu, no entity separate from it. The limitation means all entities are except this one, it is separate from it. There is no limitation in entity means there are no entity which is separate from this Brahman. There is no uh, entity separate from Brahman. No entity separate from Brahman means there is no second entity apart from Brahman. Look at the steps I am taking. Nothing apart from Brahman. No second thing apart from Brahman. No second translates directly as non-dual. Non-dual in Sanskrit is called Advaitam. Advaitam. Vastu paricheda shunyam means this Brahman must be non-dual. Advaitam. There is no second thing apart from Brahman. Whatever is cannot be apart from Brahman if this Brahman exists. So, you see this small word anantam. limitless. This small word, if you unpack it, so much has come. You are defining or the Upanishad has defined Brahman as Anantam, God as infinity. What follows from that is, if you define God in this way, then God has no limits in time, space and object. Kala, Desha, Kala, Vastu. That implies this Brahman or God which you are defining, you mean that it is omnipresent, that it is eternal and that it is non-dual. It is everywhere, it is there all the time and there is nothing apart from it. That is what it implies. That is what we have got so far in unpacking this definition. Now, the process is to go from Brahma to Anantam, from Anantam I will go to Satyam. Now the question comes. Okay, Swami, very fine. It is a concept. You have defined a concept. But, is it real? You, you can define any kind of concept. But is it actual, is there, it is actualized? Does such a thing actually exist? Does such a thing actually exist? Not only that, you have you are trapped yourself. Why? You have painted yourself into a corner. Why? If you say Brahman is all pervasive, sarvavyapi, omnipresent. If it is all pervasive, it must be everywhere, yes. If it is everywhere, it must be here, yes. Where is it? You have said Brahman is Nityam. In all periods of time, it was, it is, it will be. It is not limited in time. If it is in all periods of time, then now, it should be now also. It should be here, it should be now. Much worse, 
you have said there is no entity apart from Brahman. Vastu Pariched is not there. Brahman is non-dual. There is nothing apart from Brahman. If anything exists, it cannot be apart from Brahman. Therefore, what we normally consider as entities, this bottle, this duster, this chalk, it cannot be apart from Brahman. In other words, this is Brahman. So are you saying a chalk is Brahman or duster is Brahman? Brahman or a bottle is Brahman or a laptop is Brahman? If so, how is it Brahman? Bottle is a bottle, a duster is a duster, a chalk is a chalk, a laptop is a laptop. How is it Brahman? This is the question that arises. Now, the answer. If Brahman is everywhere, it should be here. How can we find Brahman here? If Brahman is at all times, it should be now. How can we find Brahman now? And if Brahman is not different from any object, we should be able to find Brahman in any object. Show me Brahman in this piece of chalk. And they are actually going to do that. Yes. It's, it's quite remarkable actually. Let's see. Take up Satyam. Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma. So take up the word Satyam. Satyam. Satyam means real. Satyam means real. What is real? Not a philosophical question. Don't go into realism, idealism and so on and so forth. Just a common sense approach. What is real? Well, these things are real for us. So, the chalk, is real, so chalk exists, what exists, that is the question, satyam is that which exists, chalk exists and the duster exists and the, I have given example, the table is or the man exists and the woman exists. and the uh, planet exists and so on, anything, any entity. These are real things, this is what we call, uh, call real. Now what is the problem here? The problem is a chair, a table, a man, a woman or a planet, whatever. Is this Brahman in that case? You said Satyam Brahma, Satyam is Brahman. And you are saying Satyam here is these things, uh, Satyam, Jnanam, Anantam. Satyam is these things, these objects. Now the problem is, are these Brahman, are these God? The problem will be that if you take any of these objects, is it anantam? No. Take a chalk. Is it limitless in space? Not at all. It is very limited, this much only. It is not pervading anything. Is it limitless in time? Not at all. It has a uh, point of creation and a point of destruction. Is it limitless as far as entity vastu is concerned? Not at all. There are trillions of entities different from it. It is not at all non-dual. And yet, the Upanishad says, Satyam is Brahman. Now you have a contradiction. They do not fit. Do you see why they do not fit? What we normally consider Satyam is not Anantam. Every entity has limitation. But the Upanishad insists that Brahman is both Satyam and Anantam. How do you fit them? In this case, in, uh, in Vedanta, the procedure is to do something called Lakshana. implied meaning. Implied meaning. What do, what do you mean by implied meaning? It is something that we always do. I purchased a mango from the shop. I ate the mango. I ate the mango. Look at the, it is a common sentence we use, but look at the different sense in which we are using the word mango. When I say I purchased the mango, I purchased the whole fruit. When I say I ate the mango, you immediately understand, I, you mean that I, uh, you ate the flesh of the mango. You left the seed and the skin out. You do not say that uh, you are lying. You say you ate the mango, but you are leaving out a, a big portion of the mango. You immediately take the implied meaning. When I say ate the mango, certainly 
he means that he ate only the eatable portion of the mango. What is Ganga? Ganga is the river from Gangotri, Gomukh to Bay of Bengal. I took a bath in the Ganga. Now, you will say that uh, you took a bath in the Ganga, does it mean that you swam all the way from Gomukh to the Bay of Bengal? No. In Belur Mat, I just went to the bathing ghat there and I took a dip in the river. That's all I mean. And you understand that. Everybody understands it. When I say Ganga is a river, it means the entire river from Gomuk to Bay of Bengal. When I say I took a bath in the Ganga, it means I took a dip in one tiny portion of that river. It's clearly understood by every, everybody. And we always use this. We easily understand in what sense the word is being used. Sometimes we take the whole entity, sometimes we take a part depending on the situation. That taking a part of the entire meaning is called Lakshana. There are different types of Lakshana, different types of implied meaning. One way is to take a part of the entire meaning. One way is to take a part of the entire meaning. There are other ways of taking Lakshana also. But one of the ways is take a part of the entire meaning which fits the situation, which fits the context, which is appropriate. Here, what can we do? Remember, what is required here? What is required here is we need a something that is satyam at the same time it is anantam. Something that is real at the same time it is limitless. It is all pervading, it is unlimited in time and nothing that exists is apart from it. You take this, the, the lakshana, implied meaning. You take what is common to all of them. Whichever entity you regard as Satyam, you definitely, we all of us, we have the feeling that it exists. It's tautological. Moment we say it is a real entity, what we mean is it exists. Now, this sense of existence, they say, is common to all of this existence. Isness. You take this, easiness. Where do you take it from? Any experience that you have. Chalk is, duster exists. Do you feel chalk is not? Then you would not see the chalk. You always feel chalk is. This is a sense of astitva, existence, being. In philosophy, it is also called being. It is like, I, yesterday I gave the example of these plastic chairs. Here you have 200 chairs which are made of plastic. If you count the chairs, you have 200 entities. If you count the plastic, the material out of which it is made, you have only one entity which is plastic. So you take the common entity that is plastic or the wooden furniture, you take wood. It might be a desk, it might be the door, it might be the window, but it is wood. In the same way, anything that exists, wherever we have an experience of anything real, we have two experiences, the thing itself and its existence. The things are different, chalk, duster, man, they are different from each other. But existence is common. Can we regard existence as the reality with the name and form of chalk or duster or man or woman? It is like wave and water, wave and water. We uh, would it be correct to say that the water is in the wave or wave is in the water? Our first thing would be that this wave has lot of water, as if water is in the wave. But basically it is the water which is appearing as the wave. All waves are nothing but water. Whenever we see various waves, we are seeing the wave and water. Or more precisely, we are seeing the water only in that form. It is water which appears as waves. The waves are in the water. According to their way of thinking, the Vedantic way of thinking, existence, this is reality. All beings are in existence. That if whatever we regard as real are just like waves in water, they are in existence. All things are like waves in water. Waves, a tsunami wave and a bubble, all of, both of them are because of water only. It is water which is common to them, which appears in those forms. So, our language does not reflect that. Our language is, uh, it shows that chalk exists. But rather, Vedanta would be 
happier saying that existence chalks. Existence is appearing as a chalk. Like water is appearing as a wave, existence is appearing as a chalk, existence is appearing as a duster, existence there is a human being, a man, a woman, a chair, a room. Empty space exists. Now this existence has no limit. Think about it. Is there anywhere that existence is not, any space where existence is not? If you say that space is, existence is. If you say that is there any time when existence is not? If you say there is a particular time when existence is not, then that, uh, then the, that time itself is not. It must exist. The existence must be there for anything, for any reality to be predicated. Existence is not limited to any vastu. Anything that is must have existence. Is there any vastu apart from existence? Is there any entity apart from existence? If I ask you this question. Logically speaking, anything that is separate from existence immediately becomes non-existent. An entity apart from existence, if I say chalk, I separate existence from chalk, what will happen to chalk? It's not existence which will get wiped out, chalk will immediately disappear. If you remove the water from the wave, what will happen to the wave? Disappears. A little shadow will be left, nothing will be left. It simply disappears. You extend that concept to a very abstract concept of existence and you see, if you can turn your thinking around, that instead of things having existence, it is existence which appears as things. If you say what is existence in itself, I understand what is water in itself, what is existence in itself? Inconceivable. If you want to experience existence, it must have some form. It must come as a certain form. One, uh, and it is a real incident which I am narrating. One Swami, uh, he was, uh, he asked his Guru, it happened only 60, 70 years back, he asked his Guru in the Himalayas, if existence is the reality, what is the need of all these forms? If you say God is, what you are trying to say here is God is existence itself. That is what you are trying to say. And if that is so, then what is the need of all this Shiva, Kali, Allah, Vishnu, different forms, different names, different conceptions of God? What is the point of all that? If you say some highly philosophical concept called existence is God, what is the point of that? And that Swami, his guru did not say anything at first. They, they used to teach in Gangotri, in, uh, uh, you have gone there. So, next day, the guru told that, that person who was questioning that Swami, Zara Pani Leana from the Ganga, just get some water for me. And that Swami said, why does he want water in this cold climate? Never, he never asks for water. Anyhow, since the guru has asked, I must get it. And he takes a tumbler glass tumbler and he goes down to the river and he cleans it and he gets a glass of water and he climbs up the hill again. I have seen that little hut and it's, the Ganga is almost 70, 80 feet below, it's flowing very fast. He climbs up that and when he approaches the Guru, the Guru starts shouting at him, what have you done? What did I ask you and what did you do? And he said, I got you this glass of water. I asked for water, why did you get a glass of water? Immediately the Swami is intelligent, he understood. In itself you cannot have water, you must get it in some container. Existence to be appreciated, you need a name and a form. And so all these names and forms religion has come up with, they are all true. But they are all basically manifestations of existence, Sat. So existence has no limitation in space, in time, in object. Any object that is, this bottle, chair, man, woman, is. Without isness, it becomes is not. In fact, you say chalk has existence or chalk is existing. You see how language plays tricks. And chalk is white. It seems to be that here you are talking of something called chalk, this is the reality and it has two properties. One is it is white and the other property is that it has got existence. 
Where did we get this? From the language. Language seems to tell us this. But this is false. This and this are not analogous. Can you prove it? Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, his theory of descriptions, he proves it very beautifully. He says, when you say something has as a property, um, okay, I can do it here. Chalk is white. What you mean is, there is, there exists X. There exists X. Exists X such that X is a chalk and X is white. That's the meaning of the term, that's the meaning of the sentence, chalk is white. Now if you put existence in that, that place, what will happen? Something funny happens. If you say chalk is existing, try to put it in this form. There exists X such that X is a chalk and X is existing. That's what will happen. And you see this existing, it's just a repetition of this. You are just repeating the same thing. There exists X such that it exists. It becomes even worse when you deny existence. If you say chalk is not existing, then the funny thing is there exists X such that X is a chalk and X is not existing. Literally you are saying there exists X which does not exist. Existence cannot be a property. Rather what Vedanta says is existence is the reality and it appears as a chalk. This is what Vedanta tries to say. This is our normal perception is this. Even philosophically, in Western philosophy, Bertrand Russell pointed out, it's a, con it's a contradiction to think of existence as a property, as a predicate. Okay. So, existence, this existence which you take as the implied meaning, the existence which you find everywhere in all real objects, that is Anantam, that is Brahman. Brahman, God in Vedanta is pure existence. And one interesting thing, the third stage I spoke about feeling it. Shankaracharya, there is a verse in Bhagavad Gita, verse number, chapter 2, 16th verse. Nasato vidyate bhavo, na bhavo vidyate sata. That which is unreal, never comes into existence. That which is real never goes out of existence. And that's the meaning. Now in the explanation of that, Shankaracharya in his commentary says, in all our perceptions, in all our experiences, we experience two things as one. We experience the thing and its existence. But we mistake it as one experience. Actually there are two experiences. I am seeing laptop. Vedanta says, no, you are seeing laptop is. I am seeing a chalk. Vedanta says, no, you are seeing chalk is. Everywhere where our experience is existence in some form. That is what Vedanta is trying to change our paradigm of thinking. And now, after having done that, the third stage of after understanding it, the feeling it, one thing is if you actually sit and contemplate existence everywhere, and we are sitting in an ocean of existence, all these objects are waves in the ocean of existence. Table, chair, person, these are waves in the ocean of existence. If you try to contemplate that way, what will happen? I cannot logically argue that out, but what will actually happen? You will intuitively feel that existence is your own existence. It is your existence. I exist, therefore the world seems to exist. That sat, that pure existence, is your own existence. That, that feeling will come if you try to contemplate that. It is not out there. The object is out there, but its existence is actually borrowed from me. I have a sense of existence. The whole world which I perceive is imbued with a sense of existence. It is borrowed from me. In Vedanta, they call it a yachita mandana nyaya. Uh, two sisters, one is married into a rich family, one is married into a poor family. And now, the sister who is poor wants to go to a mela, a fair. And uh, she goes to her rich sister 
to borrow jewels which she can decorate herself with, herself with and go to the occasion. And she goes there, after some time she comes back and returns the jewels to her sister. Yachita mandana. Mandana means to decorate, to beautify oneself. Yachita means by borrowing, by asking for something. Similarly, this entire world derives its existence from you. The pure existence which you are, that is borrowed by everything, all these names and forms around you and they appear to exist. That is an intuitive realization which comes. Okay. The name of this pure existence, isness, in Sanskrit is Sat, pure existence. Sat. All the things which we see is a name and form, bottle name, bottle form plus Sat. It exists. So these are all compound entities. They seem to be one entity. Actually, there are two things. There is one pure existence with a name and form. This Sat has no limitation in time, space and Vastu. Now let's go on to the next one. Jnanam. Jnanam. Upanishad insists, Jnanam Brahma. Uh, knowledge is Brahman. Knowledge, what, what do you mean by knowledge? It's not just book knowledge. Any knowledge that we have, any kind of conscious experience that we have is, is Jnanam. And what is this Jnanam? Taking up from what we read yesterday, any kind of experience is pure consciousness plus some mental vritti. So, are you hear a sound, what is happening is the sound is traveling, uh, these waves are traveling to your ears, it is experienced as sound inside and you have a wave in your mind, a vritti in the form of my words and consciousness within you illumines this wave. So, any Jnanam is actually vritti, a mental modification plus consciousness. So, you have chair consciousness, book consciousness, a body consciousness, various kinds of thoughts consciousness, all the experiences that we are having now is Jnanam. Now, is this Jnanam Brahma? Well, it cannot be Brahman because all these experiences are definitely not Anantam. None of them are uh, all pervasive. In all experience, the body experience will be there, not necessary. None of them are eternal, non unlimited in time. If, in fact, experiences are fleeting. They come and go. All the time you are having a variety of experiences. A stream of experiences is happening. So, no experience is eternal. And Vastu Parichet, of course, every experience is different from every other experience. Every Jnanam is different from every other Jnanam. You hear something, you see something. What you heard is different from what you see. They are two distinct experiences. So, there is Vastu Parichet, there is Kala Parichet, there is Desha Paricheda in Jnanam. But yet the Upanishad insists Jnanam is Brahman. Then you need something in Jnanam which is Anantam, which has no limitation. You have to take the implied meaning, uh, like, like we took here, implied meaning the isness in all real objects. What can you take in all experiences? Consciousness, Chaitanyam, what we found yesterday. Do you remember yesterday in the in the Panchadashi class we are talking about exactly this? Shabdas Parshadayo Vedya Vaichitriya Jagare Prithak Tat Tato Vivakta Tat Samvid Eka Rupa Navidyate. Sights, what we touch, what we smell, what we uh, hear, they are all different from each other. The objects are different from each other, the experiences are different from each other, but the consciousness which is aware of all this is not different, is one and the same. That consciousness is unlimited, anantam. It is found, how is it, uh, desha, in what sense is it not limited in space? In all, in the space of experience, in all experiences, consciousness must be there. It follows automatically, without consciousness, no experience can be there, number one. Time, in all time, yesterday we saw how this consciousness is unlimited in time. In all our waking life, consciousness is there. In all our dreams, consciousness is there. Even in deep sleep, when we appear to be unconscious, yesterday we saw how we were discussing how that unconsciousness is also, that, that blankness is also experienced. There must be consciousness in, in, a, in a form which experiences blankness of deep sleep. So, experience is not, uh, consciousness is not limited in time. How is consciousness not limited by vastu, by entity? Every experience, 
There can, cannot be any experience apart from consciousness. So as far as experience is concerned, consciousness is non-dual. No experience is apart from consciousness. So this consciousness, consciousness itself is unlimited in time, unlimited in space and unlimited by any particular experience. Desha kala vastu paricheda shunyam. So it fits with the definition of anantam brahma. So that in Sanskrit it is called chit. Sat and chit. Sat and chit. And this sat and chit, pure existence, pure consciousness is what we are, is what God is. How do you say that? Because you are defining God, Brahman. So Brahman is Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. Now what did we find? Sat Chit Anantam. Satyam Jnanam Anantam translates into Sat, pure existence. Jnanam translates into pure consciousness, Chit. And Anantam, infinite. So infinite existence, infinite consciousness, unlimited existence of consciousness is Brahman. That is the definition of God. And the trick here is, because it defines consciousness, what we are is consciousness. Yesterday we saw that in Panchadeshi, what we are is consciousness. Therefore, we are this Brahman. You or I or any, any of us, we are that Brahman, not parts of it. The whole of it, there is no question of whole or part there. We are that very entity, which is Brahman. This is the definition of God found in the Upanishads. Let me quickly go through the whole chain of arguments very quickly. You can then grasp the whole concept. What is God? The word for God in Upanishads is Brahman. What does it mean? Brahman, in Sanskrit, it comes from Bringhadhatu, the, the, the verb. It simply means vast, big, nothing else. It simply means big. If you ask big what? A big man, a big house, a big country, or a big machine, nothing is said, just big. When you just say big or vast, without qualifying it, it means infinity, anantam. Brahman literally means anantam. What does anantam mean? Na antam, no limit. Antam means limit, no limit. What is limit? Limit is um, in space, time and object. If there is no limit, no limit in space means omnipresent. No limit in time means eternal. No limit as far as objects are con concerned means non-dual. We saw the arguments. Now, where is this eternal, omnipresent, non-dual entity? Where? Says Satyam. What is Satyam? Look at the objects around you. Chair, table, man, woman, house, whatever. But these are not fitting the, the, the category of limitless. Then what is limitless in all these experiences? pure existence which is experienced in all these forms, just like water is found in all the waves. That pure existence fits the definition of anantam. So when Satyam Brahma Upanishad says, what the Upanishad means is Sat, pure existence. Similarly, Jnanam Brahma, what is Jnanam? Knowledge. Knowledge, feelings, experiences, all our conscious experiences. But is, are these conscious experiences, we hear things, smell things, talk about things, you know, all experiences, are they limitless? Of course not. Each of these experiences is limited. Then what is limited in all these, ex unlimited in all these experiences? We find, by, upon examination, consciousness is the one which is unlimited, as far as experience is concerned. So we take the implied meaning of Jnanam as Chaitanya or Chit or consciousness. Therefore, we come to the Understanding that the definition of God in Upanishads is Sat Chit Anantam, infinite existence, infinite consciousness, unlimited consciousness, unlimited existence. Remember, this consciousness is not the consciousness which we talk about in our consciousness studies or our day to day experiences, which is consciousness plus mind. Here it is consciousness in itself, which is then covered over with uh, mind for day to day experiences. You say, what about bliss, Swamiji, we normally, we in Vedanta, we hear about Satchidananda, Satchidananda, not just Satchit Anantam, Satchidananda. So that Ananda aspect is covered in another portion of the Taittiriya Upanishad, few paragraphs hence, called Ananda Mimamsa. 
that's a different subject altogether. So, for some other day, some other occasion. How is this Sat Chit also Ananda, bliss? I will conclude here, um, Swami Vivekananda's quotation. Now, it will make sense. He says, Brahman is or, the, or God is existence absolute, knowledge absolute, bliss absolute. Then he says, not that, now you can easily understand, not that God or Brahman exists, it is existence. Knowledge absolute, not that Brahman knows something, it is knowledge. What he means is consciousness. Bliss absolute, not that Brahman is happy, it is happiness. Um, that I have not explained, that part is, that it requires a separate talk. But yesterday we touched upon it, the arguments to show that the self within is permanent happiness and the highest happiness. Yesterday in Panchadashi we talked a little bit about it. So, Brahman, the definition of Brahman in the Upanishads, definition of God is, it is existence absolute, knowledge absolute, bliss absolute. Where is it? Question now is, where is it not? How can I experience it? How can you not experience it? Swami Ashokananda, one of the great teachers of Vedanta, in, who had gone from uh, India to the West, in one of his lectures I saw, he saying, what is the proof of the existence of God? And he smiles and says, foolish question. Every experience proves this God. By its very fact, if you learn to see experience with these eyes, it is God. Where is God not? When will you get God? When I die, when I go to Samadhi? No! When will you not get God? Where will I get God? In which object will I find God? In this temple or in this murti or in this something? In which object will you not find God? If the object exists, God is there. Now, I remember the other two questions. There were three questions. The knower of Brahman, knower of God attains the highest. So, this is what is meant by God. Second question, how do you know God? In very brief, the Upanishad says, Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam Parame Vyoman Who realizes this Brahman in the cave of his own heart. Literally what it means is, not as this chalk is Brahman or duster, pure existence in this duster is Brahman, not like that. Who realizes the pure existence which I feel within myself, that is Brahman or I am Brahman. This is known as uh, knowing Brahman. What do you mean by knowing Brahman? I know myself as Brahman. Till now I was thinking I am Swami Sarvapriyananda. Now I realize that Sarvapriyananda is just a name and form for pure existence. Just as all of these are names and forms for pure existence, pure consciousness. Then the third question, what is the highest which we will attain by this? The Upanishad answers, so Ashnute Sarvan Kaman Saha Brahmana Vipashchideti. One who realizes Brahman enjoys the fulfillment of all desires. This needs to be understood. If I have got desire for, uh, for chocolate and for rasam and for sambar and for uh, uh, bread, if I get Brahman, will all of it will come together and will get mixed up into one ball and I have to eat it. All desires will be fulfilled. Saha, at once, we are fulfilling all our desires. As life goes by, that's all what we are trying to do. Good and bad, high and low desires, all of them we are just trying to fulfill. But what this promises is, all our desires are fulfilled, we, are com we reach complete satisfaction at, at once together, all together. So what it means is not that all the things which we, what we want, all the um, uh, objects which we want, desired objects, they all come together. Not like that. We become one with the universe. Everything becomes one with us. The Upanishads keep talking about this. Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam, Sarva Bhutani Chatmani. I see myself in all beings. I see all beings in me. Now you can directly understand what it means. If I am existence and consciousness, I must be there in everything. Clearly it is there. Otherwise these things would not exist. I must be there in every experience. That's what I am. So I become one with the universe. That is the uh, answer, that is the highest that one, one expects. 
which means it's the fulfillment of all possible human hopes and aspirations. One goes beyond suffering also. Remember, suffering is limited to body and mind. The world of names and forms, there is suffering there. There is suffering in relationships, there is suffering in um, objects, there is suffering in the body and finally, really suffering is in the mind. Here, pure existence and pure consciousness is untouched by the body and mind. Body and mind are appearances of this pure existence and pure consciousness. Those things come and go, pure existence remains the same. Waves may come up, waves may disappear, the water remains the same. Sometimes water is in the form of a wave, a tsunami wave, a small wave, a bubble, it is still the same water. Then I will conclude with a beautiful verse from Ashtavakra, the last thing I will say. In Ashtavakra Gita it is said, Mai ananta maham bodhau, vishwa vichi sobhavata, udetu vastamayatu, name vriddhi navakshati. I am an infinite ocean of existence. In me, the universe appears as a wave. This whole universe is appearing in me as a wave. Because I am existence. Universe exists. It is just taking my existence to appear. And let this wave arise, let it set. Udetu vastamayatu, name vriddhi navakshati. I, the ocean of existence, am neither increased by birth, nor decreased by death, nor increased by success, not decreased by failure, neither increased or benefited by praise and honors and awards, nor decreased in any way by insults and uh, you know, uh, losses or troubles. Name vidhi navakshati. In the universe of names and forms, let the waves arise, let them melt back. That is what will happen in life, the waves will come and the waves will again go back. You are independent of that. They are in you, you are not in them. They come and go, they play upon your surface. You are the ocean, you are the water itself. The waves come and go, they depend on you, you do not depend on them. You transcend suffering thereby, you attain peace thereby. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hum basically wo chetna hai. That's right. We are that pure consciousness. Yes. Okay, a question there. Uh, the way we have understood uh, Satyam Brahma. Yes. How do we explain that uh, Satyam Brahma Jagatim? Ah, yes. Very good. The definition of Mithya, Mithya means false, Satya means real. The definition of Mithya in Advaita Vedanta is that which does not have its own existence, that which borrows existence. You can easily work it out now, how the world is Mithya. That which borrows its existence, the snake which appears, it is not real, it depends on the rope. If there was no rope there, I would not even see a snake. It borrows its existence from the rope. So, this world borrows its existence from pure existence, from pure consciousness. Pure existence is the reality. The world of appearance, things which seem to exist, they borrow their existence from this Sat. So they, and what is the proof that they have borrowed existence? Yesterday we had this argument, intrinsic existence versus borrowed existence. The proof is, if something has intrinsic existence, it would never go out of existence. If something has borrowed existence, then the very sign that it is created and is destroyed, it is, means it is borrowed existence. Borrowed existence, technical term in Vedanta, Mithya. Yeah. Good question. Amiji, it becomes difficult to perceive Brahman in the uh, so called injustice, poverty that we see around. So, uh, any soul or any being who has realized Brahman in everyone, how does he or she per, uh, perceive or deal with such situations or circumstances? Swami Vivekananda, somebody asked him uh, when he is teaching about spirituality, oneness with everybody. Uh, somebody asked him, Swami, what, what should one do when you see the strong oppress the weak? And Swamiji's immediate answer was, 
thrash the strong of course. Uh, so this does not prevent you from doing what is right. Rather it gives you the strength and the courage to do what is right without any fear. If that oppression is Brahman, the person who prevents that oppression is also Brahman. This oppression, justice, injustice, good and bad, all are at the level of our relative existence. Not that they are same. Not that they are same. One is something that involves you deeper into samsara. One is that will take you out of samsara, will free you from samsara. So, it is not that from point of view of Brahman, uh, justice also uh, good, injustice also good, jo bhi hai, sab theek hai, sab brahma hai. No. If you say yes to injustice, you will be caught more and more in samsara and never get to Brahma Jnana at all. One has to transcend adharma by dharma and then realize the supreme with the help of dharma, then transcends that good also. So one has to transcend bad to the, with the help of the good and then go beyond the good also. Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of a thorn which has pricked your flesh. Now you take another thorn to extract that thorn. But you will not keep the second thorn in your flesh also. You let it go. So, overcome the bad by the good and see that which is beyond both good and bad. Yes. And another thing, the law of karma which we spoke about yesterday. If I do bad things, I can't justify it by saying that Brahman is there, so Brahman, that is also Brahman. The result of bad will be bad. I have to be ready to take the punishment for that. Result of good will be good. But Brahman is the ground of the appearance of both. Yes. So, if there is only one consciousness, one pure existence, at that level you don't speak about karma also. Karma, any action, see any object, any action, moment you say the karma is, then what happens? Easiness is the reality, the karma is an appearance. At that level, we are talking about the final definition of God, Brahman. Whom it is attached is this existence consciousness, identifying itself with an appearance called the mind, thinks of itself as a jiva, as we individual beings. What do we think of ourselves as? We do not think of ourselves as existence and consciousness. If you do, you are blessed already. But if you do not, you are more, more like most of us. We think we are this limited individual. We are trying to transcend this limitation with the help of this philosophy. This limited individual is one the one who is doing karma and gets the results of karma. You will say according to this philosophy, the limited individual is mithya. Yes, ultimately it is mithya. Is, is truly, uh, yes, pure consciousness plus mind. Correct. Jivatma is pure consciousness plus mind. The Jivatma must realize itself as pure consciousness, not the mind. So, we should serve God or worship God. What is the need of that if we are God? Well, we do not realize ourselves as God right now. A dualistic attitude towards God that I am uh, a limited being and this Satyam Jnana Manantam Brahma exists. Somehow as apart from me, that is how I feel at, to begin with. Then it becomes God and I become a limited individual. Then comes worship and praise and puja and that is not wrong. There is a story in which Hanuman was asked by Ramachandra, what do you think of me? Ramachandra is God and Hanuman is the devotee. So Hanuman was asked by Ramachandra, what do you think of me? So the individual says to God, now God is asking the individual, what do you think of me? The individual says, Hanuman says, Deha buddhya dasoham, identified with this body, I am thy servant, thou art my lord. Jiva buddhya twadangshaka, as a jiva, as an individual who is occupying this body now, will, has been in different bodies earlier, will go on to other bodies, Jivatma. You are the whole, I am thy part. Atma buddhya tvamevaham miti me nishchitamati. But as pure consciousness, Atman, you and I are one. The devotee is telling God, as pure consciousness, you and I are one. See how beautifully it is reconciled. Bhakti is correct. Meditation is correct, karma yoga is correct and jnana takes you to the ultimate that 
identification with Brahman. Ah, is Ananda quality of Satchidananda? You see, in a dualistic interpretation, Sat, Chit and Ananda are all qualities of God. Infinite existence, bliss, knowledge. But in Advaitic interpretation, infinite existence, infinite knowledge and infinite bliss is God, not quality. Just like I showed here uh, in that Butter and Russell, you know, that if you take existence as a quality, the problem will be like this. And same thing about knowledge and about bliss also. So according to Advaita Vedanta, Ananda is not the quality of God. Ananda itself is God. But we must not mistake. So I had a, a nice rasgulla. I got a lot of Ananda. That is God. No, that is pure bliss plus rasgulla, nama, rupa and experience. The pure bliss is there. Shankaracharya says, all our bliss that we experience in life, every bliss, from the crudest sensuous pleasure to the most refined pleasure that we get in life, all of that, he says, these are, you know, this is like spray from the ocean of Ananda, which is Brahman. Just a little bit of that. The whole ocean of Ananda is you yourself. And we are, it's like the ocean chasing a little bit of spray which has come out from it. Yes, a question there. Sir, uh, uh, you talked about three, three levels of understanding, first to listen and then to, uh, then at the third stage when you feel it. Feel it. So, uh, doesn't that feeling, can that feeling make you extremely sad or anxious that apart from b uh, bringing it uh, bliss to you, you are not happy that whatever you perceive till now is all wrong. It's, it's, it's a completely different fact altogether and you are extremely sad by that fact. Uh -huh. Actually, it will not make you sad. I'll tell you why. The reason is, whatever we know and whatever we want in life, look at, look at what we really want in life. We want to live. Nobody really wants to die. If things are okay, I really want to live. We want to live. We want happiness. And we want awareness, knowledge. You know, more and more. These three things we fundamentally want. And now what Advaita Vedanta is telling us is, you are infinite existence. You never need to be afraid of dying or going out of existence anymore. You are infinite happiness. You don't need happiness from little, uh, this little fast food there, this little gadget there, for this little relationship there. You don't need. If those things come, welcome. If they go, even more welcome. No problem. So, you, your happiness is your own. It's secure. And knowledge, in every knowledge, you are the consciousness. That variety which you experience as knowledge is within you. So, there comes a kind of deep peace, not sadness. In fact, you will see, the proof is in the lives of all those who are uh, men and women of realization, Brahma In every religious tradition, saints, they are happy people. They are happy people. There's somebody who said, quipped, a sad saint is a sa a saint who is sad is a sad saint. Uh, one, many years ago, one of our old monks, see, he went to the president of the Ramakrishna mission the, at that time. And he was saying, Swami, I have these problems, uh, Ashanti, Mane Ashanti, I've got some disturbance in the mind. I am unhappy because of this, I am unhappy because of that. Then that senior Swami scolded him, left and right. And this monk became scared, shaky. I am sorry, what did I say? That's wrong. Then senior Swami said, people come to you for shanti, for peace. You are a monk, you have come to realize the self. If you don't have shanti in your mind, what can I do? So in spiritual life, it is possible to be sad, but then there is something wrong with spiritual life. Something wrong in our approach to spiritual life, which is making me sad. You just put it right, you'll, you'll get the happiness, which is your birthright. In Panchadashi itself, the book I spoke about, I'm pushing Panchadashi because I think it's there on the on the menu there. There, towards the end, there's one chapter called Tripti Deepa, and they ask the question, why are spirit truly spiritual people, those who have really realized something in their life, why are they so happy? Why are they so peaceful and happy? And they say it says because of these reasons. Krita Krityataya, Praptavya Praptataya, 
ज्ञातव्य ज्ञाततया बिकॉज दैट पर्सन हैज अ फर्म अनशेकेबल कन्विक्शन दैट वॉट हैज टू बी डन इन ह्यूमन लाइफ आई हैव डन इमेजिन द काइंड ऑफ पीस दैट कम्स विथ इट प्राप्तव्य प्राप्ततया वॉट हैज टू बी अटेंड गॉट इन ह्यूमन लाइफ आई हैव गॉट ज्ञातव्य ज्ञाततया वॉट हैज टू बी अंडरस्टूड और नोन इन लाइफ आई हैव नोन दैट after this everything is just detail if it comes good if it does not come there is no more hankering for anything your next question will be won't all zest for life go away it does not go away these persons are the freest mm. they don't hold on to life they don't hanker up after life but when they live they are full of joy and and people around them get a touch of that peace and joy i've seen such people yeah last question Okay, okay sir, uh, then then you ask. I'm just uh, wondering. So I mean, the uh, pure consciousness is uh, is um, eternal, but uh, as we as we uh, as we live every day, do we uh, change our consciousness? I mean, not the pure, not the pure consciousness, the individual consciousness. Can you speak into the mic, huh? So as we live every day, uh, as we live every day, do we um, uh, improve upon uh, our individual consciousness? Okay. all improvements are at the level of the mind you can work this out assignment changes and improvements where are they level of body and mind poorly developed mind same consciousness pure consciousness illumines that i study hard and i understand what is being taught same consciousness illumines the understanding in bhagavad gita there is a shloka in 15 chapter where bhagwan says matta smriti gyanam apohanam cha from me alone from me means here you take existence consciousness bliss from me alone is memory is loss of memory is knowledge and ignorance all of them are from me only from consciousness consciousness alone tells me i have understood consciousness alone tells me i can't understand consciousness is one and the same you are that all this understanding not understanding changes in the mind development of the mind deterioration of the mind all are at the level of the mind not in consciousness so loosely i am talking from the point of view of vedanta loosely you will find in many books we talk about transformation of consciousness elevation of consciousness uh, stages of consciousness vedanta will say you are making a technical mistake transformation elevation stages are all in the mind consciousness is one unchanging absolute okay question here y- your question is also intelligent ah remember the difference between intelligence and pure consciousness it's a uh, intelligence in in this terms is called buddhi in vedanta intelligence is called buddhi and it's part of the mind consciousness acting on the mind acts as buddhi intelligence acts as chitta memory acts as ahankara i sense which we are feeling now i sense acts as mind memory manas um, mind itself manas mana buddhi chitta ahankara intelligence i sense the mind itself and memory all of them are in the what what i am generally calling the mind and consciousness itself is it intelligence or not is consciousness unintelligent it is the very essence of intelligence without it intelligence doesn't work uh, so uh, my question is that all the things what happened in past and what is going to be happen in future all these things uh, are they planned in the mind of god that is already planned all right so uh, that is a further question you are asking here we discuss the essential nature of god now in vedanta they speak about this consciousness satyam gyanam anantam brahma with something called a power of maya that is called ishvara and that ishvara actually is the creator sustainer and destroyer of this world so that ishvara is sarvagya knower of all details so, uh, so that so yes that in that case it would ap- ap- apply to that ishvara but that okay. is secondary what is more important is god is this pure consciousness you also are that pure consciousness in that sense you are one with god uh, so maya and uh, this pure consciousness are different are different yes just as all these names and forms they are different from pure consciousness they exist because of pure consciousness maya also 
which is the source of all these names and forms. Okay, uh, is so different from pure consciousness and exists because of pure consciousness. It is okay. the power through which pure consciousness expresses itself as the world of multiplicity. So, uh, so uh, this power and the pure consciousness, uh, uh, both the things are eternal, means they existed uh, parallelly. Yes, but then you will say, so there is Dvaitam, there are two things. One is this power called Maya and another one is this pure consciousness Brahman. Yes. Would you say that? Yeah, yeah that's a typical question that's asked. Now let me uh, ask you, um, see this, is it, is this a table or wood? It's basically a wood in the form of a table. Ah, so are there two things here, one table and wood? No. No, the table exists depending upon the wood. Am I justified in saying that the wood is more real than the table? You would say, yeah. Why? Because the wood can exist without the table. Before it became a table, it was wood. After it will be broken, it will still be wood. In the same way, existence consciousness bliss is a permanent reality upon which the power called Maya plays. So Maya is not apart from it. You cannot say there are two things. One is Maya, one is Brahman. Rather, Ma, uh, Brahman is the only reality and so Maya is not apart from it, we will say, is, is it Brahman? In the same way I can say, is this table wood? You will say yes and no, because all wood is not table. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Brahman can be existed in manifested and unmanifested form ah, also? Yes, that is a very good question. I will answer that and uh, we will bring it to a close. Can Brahman exist in manifestation and unmanifested forms? That is such a good question, why I will tell you. The Hindu Vedantic idea of creation, this universe, basically it means manifestation and again the unmanifested. This whole universe is now created. It means through Maya, the Satchidana, the existence, consciousness and bliss is manifested as this universe. The whole universe is destroyed. The word used is pralaya. It means this whole, all these names and forms goes into an unmanifest form. Existence, consciousness, bliss remains as it is. It can be experienced only through names and forms. When the names and forms disappear, do they disappear? Yes, they disappear. They disappear daily for us when we go into deep sleep. So our experience of the universe is a microcosm. In our dream and in our waking, we have a manifested experience. In our deep sleep, we have an unmanifested experience. We, the watcher of that experience, we are separate from both the manifest and the unmanifest. So Maya has these two forms, the unmanifest which is Maya itself and the manifest which is this universe. Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss is separate from that but separate only in the sense that wood is separate from table. So uh, what is the need of this uh, pure consciousness to get manifested? Means why can't it uh, remain in unmanifested uh, form all the time? You can ask this question that other way around also. Why not? And all, many theories have been, uh, in this there are many theories. So there are theories in Bhakti Shastras, devotion, devotional ap approach, that it is the Leela of God, the play of God. The, then there are other things, you know, law of karma. We all have karmas. Because of the grace of God, we get to experience this world, that is why manifestation is necessary. Uh, you can argue, because then you will again argue that we ourselves are that pure consciousness, why do we have karma, how did it begin, so these are questions are there. The best answer I have found is Gaudapada Acharya in Mandukya Upanishad, Mandukya Karika, finally after considering so many theories, he finally comes and says, Devasya Esha Swabhava, this is the very nature of that shining thing called existence consciousness bliss to shine forth in these ways. Sometimes it shines forth, sometimes not shining forth. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaskar. So with this we come to the end of uh, this wonderful, inspiring and distinguished series of lectures on Vedanta. Uh, they are not only spiritually uh, enriching but also philosophically very rigorous. That's distinct, that is what is distinguishing uh, about this, these lectures and about Swamiji. So let us once again thank Swamiji for being with us uh, all here and let us uh, request him to come back to us, keep coming back to us whenever it is possible for him.